I like when I first started intros were the worst part of this, and I've slowly gotten better. And then yeah. every time I sit down and try and do one again, I'm like, fuck, they still, no, they still so, suck. So like when I was doing like YouTube content, I always <laughs> never knew how to start my mm -hmm. video. I felt like it was so cheesy. And yep. I kept like trying different things, and then it like you just say one thing, it works, and then you just keep doing it. But like yeah. intros for me were always the hardest part of every video that I made, like a hundred percent. I've been trying to like shoehorn it into like the something from everyone title and shoehorn in like, well, I want to learn something for everyone. And what I want to learn from you is yeah. uh, I think that, that is true. I don't want like, but the something from everyone thing was more of like, I want to do this. And I need to call it something. <laughs> so now, like sho shoehorning in that in like the intro feels like almost fraudulent. Like I do want to learn something for everyone, but I just yeah. want to talk to everyone in that process. I will. No, I hear you. The flip side of this to me, though, is that I'm creating like a like a time capsule. I think is a really interesting piece of this, uh, where th in the future we can all look back at this, and I can look back at this and remember our moment, and we can remember this and all the stuff yeah. that we'll chat about today. And I think to me that's a cooler part of the show. Is like I, I want so to too. learn from everyone. But I want to just create this time capsule that other people can consume. As I was going through old set sale stuff, it was fun to like look through and see myself at old concerts and all this bullshit. Oh, yeah. Um, and now to have homies here, it's like, yeah, I want you here. I'm excited to have this. I'm excited to like lock this in to like the, the historical record permanently. Same, man. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm, I'm pumped to be on it. No, um, it's going to be cool. Hell yeah, dude. Episode 33. Uh, so I'm officially a third of the way to my 100 episode goal. Uh, that's the mission. We're going to keep it moving. 100 episodes. That's weekly until 2025. Uh, yeah, it's dude. like January 2025 is when I would hit it. So we're going to keep moving. For now, Peter Murphy is here. Dude, thanks for coming through. I know you were coming from far away. Yeah. Uh, so I went down to New Jersey and I saw Fall Out Boy and Bring Me the Horizon. So, all the, I, so I drove down on Thursday, <laughs> worked from home on Friday, and then my brother and I woke up at 6.30 yesterday, <laughs> drove all the way down there, just spent the day, boardwalk, all that Jersey stuff. Then we got to the show. And it's funny because that tour – has like nine openers, but like if you zoom in super close, you see the symbols with the dates and sure. everything. Yeah. We made it, I think, five minutes before Bring Me the Horizon played. Like Damn. we found our spots in the lawn, we're chilling, and then like they just started, we're like, oh my God, like what we just totally like almost missed them. So like that would have been a heartbreaker because I know my brother and I saw them uh at when we were young and that was his first experience seeing them. But yeah. he's never seen them in like an arena like type like you know, yeah. more intimate, like concert type thing. So that was a big thing for him. So yeah, obviously we went, we saw Fall Out Boy. They were cool, but yeah, I think the, the, the day's activities kind of caught up with us. So we just went home, but it's been <laughs> yeah. like, it must be like almost 10 years since I saw them last or like, like five years, probably since I saw Bring Me. Yeah. I, I feel like I've, yeah, they've grown tremendously since then. And I'm missing out on so much production and just like, it's yeah. crazy. I'm looking at like their Spotify numbers and like, it's just like, I don't realize how popular they are. And like, I think TikTok and like all the meme yep. music that's, you know, like, it's funny. They're, they're talking like, um, or what is it? They're like, like Pierce the Veil has a song that's going viral on TikTok now. So crazy, like yeah. that, you know, all yeah. these like bad omens blow up on TikTok. Like all yep. these bands are just like resurging and resurfacing and just gaining new popularity. And like, yep. maybe the horizon is like definitely that band now. I mean, doing their stuff with like Lil Uzi and like all that's it's like it's insane what they're doing now and like how mainstream like that music that we thought was like our own little thing what it's turned into it's 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 insane and I personally like it I know a lot of people don't like it but I like it the the most shocking part of the bring me thing is how long they've been doing this so this morning I saw a, a tweet that 10 years ago is when all these like posed that thing of like yep you can come get a polar with me for free you fucking cocksuckers or whatever this <laughs> dumb thing was yeah that was Take the sleep with the sirens thing yeah that was so funny uh, but it's like oh so even 10 years ago he was still like the guy and that yeah. Yeah. like struck me as like how long they've been prolific and on top of the world and how long he's been on top of the world yeah. and like dictating culture it's for us. crazy man um dude so <laughs> that's the the highest end of our scene <laughs> i wanted to go back to the very very low end of our scene back to the early days of glamour years uh obviously we're in the set sunrise universe i can't have you on and not bring up the best band of all time of course um before I get in, I'm curious, like, when you first hear Set Sail at Sunrise, is this, like, a happy time? Is it a negative time? Like, I feel like bands are hard to reflect on because I look at them like relationships. Like, they yeah. always end in a breakup or in a great success. You get married and you live on forever, hopefully. Yeah. But that's not most people. Most of the time it ends in, like, this, this turmoil. Is it still, like, fun to look back on or has it, like, just been clouded by all the other bullshit that got in the way? No, absolutely. So, like, when I think of Set Sail, it's, like, one of those things that I always think back as, like, one of the – some of the best times of my life because, like – in high school, I always grew up being like that, you know, because I grew up in a town where like metal and rock music, like it definitely wasn't 
like something that a lot of people liked and yeah. really uh, accepted. So when I kind of yeah. fell into this world of like playing music and like meeting these people and like just having these experiences, like it was so awesome. Cause like when growing up, I would play sports. I'm not good at that. I tried drawing and doing other forms of media. Wasn't good at that. But the one thing that I know that, um, or at least I thought I was good at yeah. was doing music and I loved doing it at the same time. So when I think of that, I think of like, that was when I really like came out of my shell, right? Because I was in college, yeah. I was making all these new friends, seeing these, you know, hanging out with new people, doing new things. And then on top of that, I was doing the music and that's like, it, it was great. So like every time I think back to even just like the early days and like even towards the end, I mean, I just from start to finish, it was like definitely one of the best times of my life. And I just love every time I look back on it, as many lows as there were, there were, sure. there were so many more highs and like, it was, it was awesome. So yeah, I, it's definitely a good time in my life. All right, good. That's good context. <laughs> well, where does this start for you? You mentioned like that you kind of, that music feels like the place you feel comfortable, but my memories, you start with like YouTube vocal cover. So it doesn't start with like your bands pulling you in and being like, Ooh, come do this. It yeah. starts with you having to internally be like, I'm gonna take a chance. <laughs> Is that like a fair, a fair beginning? Yeah, no, definitely. Like, so I did start with like vocal covers and, um, I just kept, I always did like little projects here and there, like little garage band type stuff, like just doing mm -hmm. covers. I remember doing like, even like the earlier days before doing vocals, I was playing bass and doing like Nirvana and Green Day covers. I didn't so know like, that. But okay. like, I loved just doing like, like music and creating and yep. just even just making own original stuff. It never really got there, but I think I started doing it in high school. And then with um, my good friend from high school, and we just did it like in his, in his room, just posting them for fun. We got like, um, it, we thought it was like a huge deal, but do you remember archaic clothing? Ah uh, yes. yes, it was like oh, an, yeah. yeah. They were doing like an endorsement thing, and we thought it was like so sick that we got that. Mm -hmm. We had like ten likes on Facebook. We had like two demos out that sounded horrible, like literally terrible. Um, and we thought it was so cool. They gave us like a discount code. Like yep. our family members are like congratulations to them, like being endorsed. We're like, but it's so strange because we're like, why did this happen? And then we like checked their like artist page on on their website. <laughs> hundreds hundreds of bands and we're like oh we're not that special whatever Everyone, but yep. like getting like that little like um spark of excitement from it like yeah. oh my god like something cool happened that's what like really drove me to like maybe i should do covers maybe i should get myself out there and then when i was approached by the guys in set sale like that was when i was like absolutely this is awesome this is my opportunity i gotta do it yeah and yeah so it was <laughs> that's where it sort of started it was um, like recording demos screaming in my car in the shower like doing mm -hmm. all that stuff to like just yeah making it happen and when i saw the opportunity i took it and it was i'm very happy i did it i'm laughing at the archaic clothing story i brought back the uh the cold cock whiskey time and it's the oh, same thing it was the it was just, same thing a yeah. company just shotgunning out sponsorships of like let's just blast our name out yeah. and use these local artists uh the funny part of the cold cock thing is i remember when that happened it like inspires me of like oh if these bands can do it then i can yeah so me as a photographer is emailing this whiskey company like hey how about me <laughs> and in hindsight i found those emails one time and like that made me reach out to like other companies and it's like i don't know i didn't reach out to like i don't know i don't know who else i reached out to but it's so funny to think of me as like yeah reaching out to people being like dude i have like a hundred followers dude you gotta you gotta give me a discount code yeah it's crazy just, man. just the delusion we start out with um <laughs> Everything's a big deal, though, you know, yeah. especially when you're younger. I mean, you you get like one thing going yeah. for you and you're like, oh, my God, I can keep doing this. And it's awesome. It's, yep. it's an awesome feeling. Where does the set sale like start gaining momentum? And so you mentioned the guys ask you, how do, how do they ask you? Do you know them before? Like, yeah. So like um, a few mutual friends. So when I was going to uh, go when I was going to college, I knew some people. Um, Sean actually went to Southern, but like I, I sort of met him through somebody else at Southern. And then like that's, you know, sort of how I got acquainted with him. But they said they were looking for a vocalist. Things weren't working out. And um he told me like, just post a cover and I'll show it to the guys and see what they want to do. So I went to my friend's house. I, I, we got in his basement. It's the same kid that I recorded, um, like stuff with in high school where we got the archaic sponsorship or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And like, I just recorded a Chelsea green cover and it wasn't anything like set sale, but I just really wanted to like, you know, knock them on, the, you know, knock sure. them off their feet and yeah, like, yeah they loved it and i was like cool awesome so they said i was in i met the band we we hung out got acquainted and uh yeah just sort of went from there i guess hell yeah uh during your first show first time on stage and like to me joining a band seems so scary of this like when you're forming a band with your friends for the first time like you get to be a part of the identity mm. when you're joining you're now forced to like assimilate to a pre-existing identity and that just seems like a terrifying process to me it was so overwhelming because it was so different for me because i'm getting acquainted like with all these people i've never met before all the friends mm. of the band all the girlfriends all the fa like actual fans that show up and like it's just kind of like sensory overload like stepping into this role and like but i do remember the first show the first show was at the space in hamden and i Dude, I cannot remember who we opened for, but they were, I think they were some like heavier band from, um, 
I, I think they were called as artifacts. I think is okay. what they were called. And they were from, I think the West coast and they were just coming through and like, they're like, this is our first show. Let's do it. And I was so nervous. It wasn't even funny. There was maybe including band members, 30 people there. Uh, yep. I, you know, but I was still nervous and like, I didn't have much time. I mean, I think I remembered I had maybe like a, a month maybe to prepare and like, I've never listened to set cell before that. Like I knew who they were, but like, I remember I didn't know the words I was making up the words I was going, I'm like, I'm screaming. No one's going to notice, but there were some times where I just drew a blank and I don't remember like any of the words. And I was just handing out the mic a lot, like letting people sing. And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to have fun, but deep down I was like, I don't know the fucking words. So <laughs> help me out here. You know, that kind of thing. But it was really fun. I mean, that's when like, I got acquainted with like so many good friends. Um, you know, a lot of people I met for the first, time there and i'm sure there's a lot of people that were still at that show um that i'm still friends with today which is awesome so yeah that was a really memorable first show um everything else after that kind of you know it was like <laughs> local shows playing to empty rooms yeah. the whole thing um but i think where we really hit momentum at least it was for me personally was when we played i think we opened for attila i see stars i don't know who else was there but that was like my first like big room show like we played the under it was my first underground show it was packed. I mean, we got the slot right before the doors. You know, it was it was perfect. It was so cool. And like that was such an amazing mm -hmm. experience to me. And I it's also really memorable because I remember it was uh like snowing super hard. So I'm like, oh my God, are people gonna show up? Is anyone gonna be there? Like, can we get there with like the trailer and everything? And yeah, we made it happen. And it was that was really where we got momentum. It's like where I signed my first like ticket or signed anything for that yeah. matter. Like people came up to me and they're like, Can you sign something for me? And I was like, you want me to sign something? I was like, okay, cool. And like lots of people just actually coming up and telling me like, you're good at doing this thing you love doing. And I'm sure you could obviously relate when someone tells you you're good at doing something that you love doing. It is like the best feeling in the world. And it's like, it's amazing. You know? So like, that was really where I feel like I got the confidence. We had the momentum where like we can rock a, a packed venue. And like, it was just awesome. Really? Like, that, like uh, opening slot, such a fascinating. So Justin Leach was just on and he was chatting about that formula. So the, the Webster used to have like the main stage show that the touring package come in yeah. uh, and the underground would have four or five local bands on. And the, the, the worst places to be was first or last because first no one's at the venue yet like they're mm -hmm. still letting people in and last they've already opened the venue doors to the main stage and everyone's just going to get ready for the main bands no one gives a fuck but if you hit that perfect window right in the middle yeah where the room is full but it hasn't emptied into the big room you get this perfect crowd and you get to play to a huge show yeah and it was interesting to hear justin talk about it because in justin's idea it was like and i think i agree with him is that like it was just 10 bands and 10 bands is just too much like it, is. it just it stinks for a lot of people but the flip side is like it does give this one local band a really interesting opportunity to yeah. play a sold out room that they have no business like they didn't sell the room out it has nothing to do with them. Yeah. But you get the experience, you get that taste. And I think that wind in your sales, that momentum is so valuable. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's funny you mentioned like the, the slot placements. I don't know if Justin talked about this, but there were times where we sold the most and it was based on whoever sold the most played later. But we've asked multiple times because we, we picked up on how that worked, right? Mm -hmm. We knew because we played, we were that band that sold the most. We were pumped. And like during the first 30 seconds of our first song, the doors open, everyone runs out, yeah. right? So we picked up on it and like, hey, you guys sold the most tickets. You guys get to play last. We're like, can we actually get the slot before mm -hmm. the doors open? Because mm -hmm. that is the best one. And like, I remember seeing all these poor bands that d they just didn't know. It's like, the do worst. they know? Yeah. They don't know. And they're like, oh my God, we're playing last. It's so cool. And like, yeah, we, we, we screwed a lot of bands over, unfortunately, but <laughs> I'm sure every but everyone picked yeah. up on that. You know, all yeah. of our friends, you know, in honor of Limitless, like all those other bands that everybody was kind of fighting for it, even though it like, you didn't want to sell too many tickets, but you'd also didn't want to be like the first few. So yep. it was a very strange process, but once you pick up on it and you master it, it was, it was really fun. <laughs> Once you like play like that slot right before the doors open, yeah, yeah, it, it was awesome. Yeah, uh, it's such a yeah great place to be. And I think it's interesting how those little victories can snowball into so much more. Where yeah. for me, it's the first time. Yeah, I get approved to shoot a main stage show, and it's like I had no business being there. But th that little victory, that little taste of it's like, oh, maybe I do belong here. Maybe there is a chance that this is possible for me. Yeah, uh, and I think I've, in that same note, I think I look at set sale as like watching you guys go through this process what teaches me like oh this is possible and i kind of relate to i think as a kid from the suburbs where metal isn't on the the forefront of our yeah. community uh and so it was seeing someone else get involved and it's like oh this is a thing you got to put the time in it's gonna be a weird thing there's gonna be ups and downs and yeah. uh it's gonna take an awkward comfortable like awkward upload on youtube of being like it's weird to film yourself yelling into a microphone right like, it's not comfortable yeah but that has to be step a to get to step b and seeing for the band i think that made it easy for me to pick up the camera and be like yeah, this is going to suck for a little bit. It always does. <laughs> but, yeah. And I always tell people too, like, um, especially with like Twitch streaming and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like 
they're always like, well, what if no one watches or what if no one checks my stuff out? It's like, well, if you're doing it for yourself or just not doing it, no one's checking out your stuff anyway. So yep. you might as well just see what happens. And I, I tell everyone that too. I mean, if I was playing a show and there was nobody there, I just treated it as like a practice. You know, I yep. might as well make the most of it. You know, there yeah. there have been, you know, I've played more empty rooms than I can count, but I've also played more packed venues than I can count. You you get a little bit of everything. And like once mm -hmm. you just adapt to that mindset, like, okay, this isn't ideal. But like, how do I make the best of it? And I think the best thing you could do is just like act like nothing's going on, or at least just adjust to your mindset to where you could just you could just have fun. Yeah, and I think that the, that same mindset has made the podcast so easy for me to start. Yeah. Where it's like we talk, I'm talking about 100 episodes, and that's exactly why yeah. the sense of like, yeah, it's not going to happen now. It might not happen next week, but I think if I go for long enough, it could happen. And it's way easier to believe in that and make that investment once I've done this in the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, for you as a band, is it like giving you a confidence later in life that you've seen like, yeah, you were able to do this thing and it didn't make it to Sumeria, didn't make a living but it's like you did water a seed into a tree like you did have fans you did sign yeah. a ticket you did get to sell like that that confidence has to transfer with you and grow and i think that's an interesting part of our our scene that i don't know if we talk about or appreciate or even think about because we're all so young still yeah um but it is like a really scary thing that i think we're all pursuing and doing that has to pay dividends later on yeah absolutely and like when it comes to like music and like you said like taking this thing and watching it grow it did give me confidence and it carried over to a lot of other things i mean when i was doing like content for like a mm -hmm. like i think it was like a year and a half two years something like that it gave me the confidence where like look there won't be any comments there won't be any likes there won't be any views mm -hmm. um so i i think i was just used to it and i think like we were just sort of talking about like that's what makes a lot of people not want to do it so yep. but i was like no i've done this before i can make money off of this i can try to make a career out of this and the yep. twitch streaming and the um the youtube thing definitely picked up faster than i thought i mean it's all about the same thing. You just got to network. You got to meet people. You got to post the right content, figure out what works, what doesn't. It's a lot of trial and error. And like yeah. band, like that. So like being in a band taught me that, that that's everything in life. Everything is sort of trial and error, figuring out what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that I think if I wasn't in the band and I wasn't doing those things, then I wouldn't have the confidence or just the mindset to pretty much do anything. I mean, you know, yeah. it's all about making mistakes and learning from them. And yeah, I'm really thankful for like being able to, you know, be that way. Figure <laughs> like, it out. like yeah. look at life that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing that ties so much of our scene together. And I'm, I'm curious, I think we are defined by being outcasts and that is yeah. often associated with being underperformers. And it's like, no, I think that there's a really unique thing that is, yeah, maybe not in everyone, but in everyone who succeeded in this is this willingness to take chances and like, yeah, it's going to suck. And it makes yeah. me laugh of like, uh, I'm sure when it's putting out your first song with that sale and for me, it's yeah, first photos, whatever, first music video, it's like, why didn't this thing blow up? Why is this thing not famous? <laughs> and now in hindsight, it's like, yo, thank God no one saw that thing. Yeah. <laughs> like there is this kind of double entendre there. It's like, yeah, I would love for the podcast to have a thousand more views than it does. Every That'd be great. Yeah. Awesome. That'd be great. But I'm also aware of like, if I do this for another year, I'm going to be so much better at it than I am now that I'll be so grateful that no one saw this portion of the journey. Yeah. And actually, because you said something that made me think of it. So like, did you ever um, notice with like creating like, whether it's like videos or like photos or anything, like was there ever a moment where... I'm trying to think of how to put this where you realize like I'm not saying you you didn't try or you didn't put in the effort but like things that are a little less like you have to put less into end up doing better and then the things you put all the time into they don't perform as well because I saw that with like yeah. you know when it comes to like trying to do something different with a song that song tanks but the more basic stuff went up or like the videos I would make like reaction content people love that stuff but it's so mm -hmm. easy to do but when I do like 3,000 word video essays, like I'm editing all day and then I get like 200 views and I'm like, what well, What the fuck? Like, what's the point of even trying at this point? Have you, have you run into that at all? To some degree, I wonder, I, uh, my my math and science brain thinks that it's complete bullshit and that like uh -huh. the, the reason that the, the easy things seem to do well is we have no expectation to them. So when they fail, we just forget that they yeah. failed and when they do well, we remember it. Uh, and then with the flip side, it's like when we work so hard in this thing, we build it up and then when it goes out and does equal to everything else, it's mm -hmm. like, well, well, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I think I've learned to kind of separate myself from that and just, I don't know, I think I've accepted that the, I've always played a long game, I think. So yeah. to me, it's like, I don't really care if you like this thing. I hope you like this thing. I'm going to work really hard to make you like this thing. But the goal here is to just stay in business. Of course. Keep the lights yeah. on. And I believe that keeping the lights on means that in five years, what I'm able to make is so much better than what I can even dream of now that the goal now is just to keep the lights on. It's of course. Like keep, keep challenging myself, keep growing, keep taking on the scariest project. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I think for me, what was always the most successful is the most successful artist, which mm -hmm. is a very different thing. Yeah. I think when you are, uh, when you're drawing, when you're an artist, when you are creating, when you are the, I guess, primary creator of the art, yeah. then I get what you're saying. But I feel like for me, it's like a secondary creator of the art. It was always a lot more about who the, the person I was working with is than what I was doing. Of course. Um, but I don't know. It's an interesting, yeah, I don't know how as, a, as an artist you stay excited about it all. Mm -hmm. It just seems, seems tough sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it's been a fun adventure.
Cool. I don't know. I had a brain fart there, and I tried to talk and didn't make sense. Um, I feel like I've been doing that this whole time, so don't worry about it. <laughs> perfect. Uh, I wanted to chat in. Uh, one thing we touched on before we chatted is there's a guest feature, and we can name the artist or not. Uh, but I remember, and I think it's an interesting story to get into kind of the bureaucracy of behind-the-scenes yeah. stuff. So we talk about local band stuff, and it is a dream. It is a fun thing that we all get into. But there's also a lot of bullshit behind the scenes. And so I know like with, with <sighs> managers was one that was always an issue of someone taking yeah. too much money or not giving their money or taking 20% when a 2% is normal cut or whatever the, the weird issues there. Uh, but there's one that always stood out to me of like, you guys have a song, you reach out to a major label, get a major artist to feature on the song, and then get told you can't release it because the artist and the label never, yeah. never touched. Is that yeah. accurate? Yeah. So I, I, like I said, I don't know who's ever going to see this. I don't want to name names yeah. or anything. But yeah. like, yeah, it was one of those things where the producer we went to knew the vocalist of a band that was very I big that time. personally. Okay, yeah. Like they were friends, they hung out and all that stuff and he yeah. worked on all their stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that was cool. We we're like, Oh, that's an awesome in. We figured like our manager supposedly ironed out all the details. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't, I, I <laughs> forgot if it was like the label or, or who, whoever it was, maybe their manager. Yeah. But they said, since this person's name is on here and he's under contract with us, you can't make money off of this. And this is after we went out, Road trip, recorded, hotels, living, uh, you know, music video, promos. We had everything lined up to like really push this because this is like our first release with the manager. Yep. And yeah, we got an email just saying you can't do it. There was probably like, I'm not even kidding, like four or five grand total that went into that one song with that one feature. And we were told, yeah, you just, you just can't release it. And it was very annoying because that's yeah. when like the reality hits you where like this isn't as easy as you think. And we were all riding a high. I mean, that was the year we played Warp Tour. We're mm -hmm. going to like this studio who's worked on these bands that we listen to. We're getting a vocalist in a band that's really hot right now. And it just all kind of fell. And we kind of got humbled a little bit because we were like, dang, like we thought we could really do this. Like it's not as easy as we think. So, yeah, as, as much as it taught me about like good things in my life, like being in a band, like the, the whole like behind the scenes thing, managers, labels, contracts, legal stuff. I mean, yeah, that hits you really quick. So but uh, I feel like a lot of bands aren't prepared for that. Definitely. Yeah. And it's such a like gross underbelly to me that we all don't want to be aware of. And as yeah. I spend more time in this world, I become more aware of it. Mm -hmm. And every time it's like, fuck, I wish I didn't know that. And there are yeah. a couple of things or a couple of conversations I've had where it's like, damn, I really wish I could forget that. I really wish I could forget what motivated you to make this decision or where you spent this money or why the money wasn't made or where it didn't recoup or all these like yeah. little things that I can think of like, fuck, I, I would have been so much happier if I could just assume this was this perfect utopia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's tough then as I spend more time in the industry of like, I don't know how to make peace with all those things. Like mm -hmm. I want to love this thing. And the more I love this thing, the more I invest myself in this thing, the more I learn <laughs> about all the ways that it's not quite perfect. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's like this collision course that I'm not quite sure how to reckon with. But I think that was kind of your uh, same problem with streaming, right? Is that you try to get into content, you try stuff and it kind of becomes this thing of like, Oh, I'm now uh, watering down this thing. I love in the effort of making content out of it. And that yeah, yeah becomes this, this collision that's bound to happen. Yeah. And I really liked making content. Now that you mean like bring it up because when you're in a band, there's a lot of moving parts. There's there's managers, there's other people you got to hit up. There's like your, your own bandmates. And like not saying I had any issues that really like made the experience bad for me. But when you're doing content and like even what you're doing now, when you're your boss, your your own employee, you, you're the you're just the one person working on it. It just gives you not only more like creative freedom, but like, you know, that there's only mistakes like for you to make, you know, there's only yep. good things for you to do. So like when it all kind of falls on you, some people don't like that. Um, I preferred it because, yeah. you know, nothing was more frustrating than, you know, graphic designers not getting back to me or me music, maybe not being what I wanted. Like it, it's all on you. Like this is all your, your freedom of choice. You're doing what you want to do. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I think I liked that side a little bit more of it. Um, but there were also other sides of it that I, I didn't like as much. And looking back on it, I think I preferred doing the music and being in a band, but I don't know. That's just me. But yeah, I had this, both my parents are teachers uh, and they I had this conversation with them. And I think it applies to our industries as well. Yeah. Uh, and it's I know both my parents work very hard, but as teachers, they are prepared for the class. I'm sure it's also people who are showing up five minutes before the class, walking in, winging it for the students, leaving and never thinking about it. Yeah. And they're getting paid the exact same as my parents. And I was talking to my dad. I was like, which one of you guys is the idiot? Like one of you is dumb. Like one of you is working way too hard and not getting paid enough, but you yeah. are adding value to these people's lives. Yeah. And one of you is adding no value, but you're getting the same pay as some, like what, what more value do you need? You're exactly. getting yours. And so I think it's, yeah, it's fine line that we have to be aware of as content creators, as business people of like, yeah, it is a business and I, but I don't want to be the lazy professor. I don't want to be that person who's yeah. just winging it. 
but it's also like, yeah, I can't micromanage everything. There's, there's a line where it's like, at some point it has to be a job. There has to be a salary. You have to be aware of like, how much am I willing to go for mm-hmm. this, for this thing? If it's a yeah. content, it's like, well, I know this game is hot, but I hate playing this game. How much am I willing to suppress my own hate of yeah. playing this game just because I know the views are good? Um, and for me, it's like, yeah, I know certain things do well online, but it's like, I don't want to do that. I know weddings make a ton of money. Yeah. I don't want to do that. It's of good course. for my business, but like at what point, uh, yeah, at what point is it diminishing? Yeah. And it's also annoying. Cause like at a certain point you have to sell out a little bit, like you have to do those things. You have to do those projects, like just a little bit. And like, yeah. I guess sometimes it can feel like you're, you're not really staying true to yourself or like what your original goal was, but it's like, dude, at the end of the day, I mean, you, you need money. You got to have a roof over your head. You need something to eat. So whether it was like content creation or like being in a band, it's like, yeah, you, you sort of just see the money going in the right or wrong places or like, it's just not taking off or like the vision's not quite there. So, but you, you have to make sacrifices to make yeah. something work. So yeah. it's never always going to be exactly what you want. I, mean, I guarantee you every YouTuber, Twitch streamer, um, musician, they've done something where they didn't want to do it at first. You know, they, they, they had to maybe go in a different direction or try something new or whatever. But although yeah. it wasn't part of that original vision yeah, you have to do that every now and then. I've, I like to look at it as like the, the raising like the mean, raising the yeah. average of my project of like, is the, is the bad thing right now less bad than the bad thing a year ago? Mm-hmm. And if that's true, then okay, at least we're making the right, like it might still stink, but yeah. last year I had to make way bigger sacrifices for it. And now it's like, okay, I can start to reel this in and get to a place that's more, more enjoyable. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the State of Warp Tour thing. Uh, so that's ba- Battle of the Bands. Uh, my, my Warp Tour th- thing is, do you think Warp Tour ever comes back? Uh, so I'm very curious of it. I think it's this beautiful thing that gives artists so many opportunities, and I think it's culturally was great for us. Yeah. Um, but I think my my gut is that it ran its course, and that we are happy to see it go out on top before it fell apart. Yeah. Uh, and I, part of that is like I just think the I don't know. I think there's a world where that scene could still survive, where the, the industry could still survive. My understanding is that Warped Tour as a name was riddled with so many lawsuits that the entity yeah. had to go under. Yeah. Uh, and that to me is like a sad thing, but it's also like, oh, it's so much better just for it to go away and us never to know really why yeah. than watch this thing get dismantled piece by piece by piece and have yeah. to, yeah. So I don't, I don't know the full details, but I was actually watching another podcast with, um, I forgot who was on it or who was doing it, but they were talking about Warped Tour and like, I think the reason why it stopped working is because um kevin just wasn't making money off of it he was literally losing money i think almost every year but i think the problem is like there were too many bands that there was just too much going on like he was he was just trying to like you know punk rock and roll like all that stuff and i think he wasn't looking at it from like a business standpoint um again i don't i don't know this is just what i what i heard on the podcast and so i i think warp tour definitely can come back i don't think it really ran its course because it's one of those things where like every year you know you always look forward to warp tour everybody always looked forward to warp tour and um just going to music festivals like myself like since covid ended and everything um people are still going to shows i went to the yeah. when we were young festival in vegas and I, that's the biggest crowd of people i've ever seen in my life and that was just in vegas i mean there were people that flew from other countries for it like mm-hmm. we were talking to some dudes from like france or like germany or even canada like people were coming all over for this so i don't think warp tour is gonna like flop if it comes back i just think that somebody else needs to be running the show as a business person who knows how to make money on it like maybe cut down the bands or less dates or something Some, like that um i think it i think if it comes back it's going to be ridiculously successful and i think there's room for it because you still like we were sort of talking earlier about how all these bands are like going viral now all over tiktok i mean Mm -hmm. like bad omens surging up um pierce the veil kind of making a comeback with going viral again like all these bands like people are still showing up to these shows like the you know I keep saying bad omens, but like they are just like the merch, the like their tour example. dates, like yeah. this kind of music is still popular. And that's like with everybody. I mean, Spirit Box is like another example. Like these bands on Warp Tour, they they hit 20 cities across the globe with maybe six or seven other bands. It's going to sell. I think it's really going to sell. This music is, yeah. I'm not saying it's bigger than it ever was, but it's definitely not dead. I mean, yeah. I think especially after COVID, like it definitely had like a resurgence. And like, I think Warp Tour would be great if it came back. I think it gave a lot of bands those opportunities to like really, you know, get the exposure that they needed. Mm-hmm. And Warp Tour just, I'm sure everybody, when they think about some of their favorite times when they were younger, um, at least for me personally, uh, it's something that happened at Warp Tour. And yeah. I, I love yeah. Warp Tour so much. Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, 
it's hard to believe that it wasn't financially profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know the actual heard. numbers and the reasons, but um, like, apparently they just, he just wasn't making money. He had too many yeah. bands to pay, too many dates. Like there, there was just too much financial stuff it, in the background. It must be the craziest headache, but yeah, I'm wondering. And it also seems like a sad thing of like all the cross pollination that we love like all the, all the vocal features that come out of yeah. work through all the future plans that come out of that. All these people being in the same trip for the summer. Um, I don't know. I guess maybe the flip side is that we have more tours now happening all summer instead of one show per summer. happening. Yeah. And it also could be that thing where like a lot of these bands are selling so well in doing that thing, because like if a band comes, you know, through the House of Blues, for mm -hmm. example, in my mind, I would be like, oh, well, I'll just see them at Warp Tour this summer because they're probably going to be on it. So I don't care. But since there's no Warp Tour and there's no thing to guarantee seeing all these bands, you want to go to every show. And I think that yeah. might also be driving sort of like the demand in bands and like, you know, things like that. Yeah. So I don't know if it's that. I don't know if it is the popularity or whatever. But I, I really think that if Warp Tour came back and they did maybe like 20 dates or something, I think it would be successful. But. I've never ran a festival before. <laughs> I don't know if it's even realistic, but yeah, you, you never know. I would love to see it come back. Cause I mean, like I even talked to my brother who was like a little, he was just like too young to really go to Warp Tour and enjoy it. And he keeps saying like, every time you talk about Warp Tour and I see these videos at Warp Tour and you're like, oh, you could just walk up and meet the band. Like there's still that interest for people that are younger yeah. who never got the opportunity to go. And I think it would, it would, it would be great to see if it could, if it could, even if it was just one more year, one more run, let's just see if this type of thing works. If it wasn't Warped Tour, but if it was like Warped Tour, yeah. you know, I think that could work. Cause um, like when, when we were young, I mean, I was expecting like band booths, like to get merch. There wasn't any of that, like meet and greets for the bands. There was none of that. Like I was just really expecting something like Warped Tour. And like, I think that's why a lot of these festivals aren't doing well because they're, they're trying to do like a Warped Tour type thing. But like a lot, I mean, I don't know if you've heard about a lot of the festivals, but like, they're just like overselling the parking sucks like what whatever it may be but yeah there's just a lot of bands that just or there's a lot of festivals excuse me that just aren't doing it the same way unfortunately it seems like yeah there's the model i'm thinking like there was the all stores tour that was happening every year there was always it seems like there's a lot of like festival things that aren't around anymore and i'm wondering yeah what that motivation is and it might just be that you're right that it's just so much simpler to organize a tour for four bands than it is yeah. for 400 and the returns are the same so why go through the extra headache to make mm -hmm. less money on the thing um i don't know as we wrap up set sale, though, uh, anything else that stands out? So any other highlights, lowlights? I mean, I know that there's uh, a plethora of all of them. <laughs> um, but I think with, with bands, it's, I think set sale is a luxury place where you can reflect on it and not piss anyone off. Where, yeah. where there are a lot of bands that I chat with people or people who sat in your chair. And it's like, oh, there's this thing. And I just can't ask about it because it's still <laughs> too recent and still too sensitive for someone. And usually in a, in a band breakup, there's two sides that are both pretty valid. Yeah. And to only air one of those sides feels wrong. But yeah. I'm also not going to invite party A and party B on and be like, all right, guys, <laughs> let's figure it out right here. So it's all fair. No one gets their yeah. feelings hurt. Um, but yeah, in hindsight, is there anything that stands out as a band that, yeah, we can chat about now that is helpful for other bands or words of wisdom or something like that? To that effect? Um, yeah, I think it's just really just have fun with it because yeah. I think, and this is like in the most respectful way possible, but I think th like I loved Gaia. I think we made like some of the best music when we were in Gaia, but set sale was fun because we didn't have like a plan, you know, yeah. it's like we have to do this, then this, then the next, then the first show and then the, the EP release. And then we do another show. And then we yeah. like tried to map out like the two years. And I think that inevitably like delayed it. Cause I think we just tried a little too hard. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was also having six people in the band didn't help. I think less people is better. Um, yeah. it could be, it could be better, but it could also be worse. But but I think set sale was like, we were younger. We were just having fun. Like stuff just kind of was coming our way. We were taking the opportunities and just sign, kind of seeing what was ha happening. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then it, it, I think that was what was so beneficial about it. I think that's why, like, it was just more fun for me personally, because we just weren't planning. It wasn't serious. It wasn't business. We're like, let's just have fun and see what happens. So I think that would be my advice for like upcoming bands. Like, dude, just have fun. And like, until you have to get serious about it, get serious with it. Obviously you need to get serious at a certain point, but just like pl play that garage show. Like, open for that band that has 900 likes on Facebook. Like just, just take those opportunities because yeah. you never know who you'll meet. You might meet the right person, get put on the right show. Like everything is by mm -hmm. chance. And I think that that's a lot of things that happened with us. Like just playing the right shows, meeting the right people, getting acquainted with the right people and just, yeah, but just at the same, just have fun. Cause I feel like yep. it's, a, it's a business and people just start to hate it after a while. I think you yep. just gotta have fun. I, I love that you said that that is the number one kryptonite I see in every band I work with where yeah. it's like, man, there's so many times where we're on set and I hear them talking in this timeline format. It's like, I, there is value for sure. There's yeah. value in being planned out. And as certainly as you climb the ranks, there's more and more value in planning further and further. 
But for sure, it's like, man, so many people just get paralyzed by this thing of like, we got to release the album at the perfect time. Yeah. And it's like, no, the perfect time was last week. That's what I'm saying. Like, the perfect time is to have it out already and already have people listen. Like, there's no reason for a lot of the buildup and a lot of promo. It's like, yeah. you're not like when, when Bring Me the Horizon is teasing an album, like that is garnering significant attention. When you're a local band and you're teasing it, it's like, there's no one's interested, right? Like I, you, I hate, I hate to burst people's bubble, but. Yeah hyping up an album or something like obviously promoting it and everything is different but like mm -hmm. hyping and like doing all this extra stuff dude it's not really gonna help you mm -hmm. i think when you've got it just say hey this is the date we're gonna drop it check it out yep obviously you got to promote it do music videos promos like do enough but like don't do too much with it mm -hmm. you know because then it's just gonna like you said delay delay delayed we got to do it here we got to do it now we got to do all this stuff before like it's just if you do too much then like it just it just kind of get it drowned out a little bit the, i guess is the best way to put it exactly that the worst part to me is that then the thing finally comes out for yeah. me it's music videos finally comes out and you've already posted about it 10 times <laughs> And now you're going to post that at 10 more times and expect anyone else to finally yeah. go look at the thing. Like you've already saturated that thing, that interest and that curiosity and completely diminished it. So yeah, I'm totally with you of like put out something short and small a week ahead. Yeah. And that's that. And I then agree. just let the thing happen and then do all your talking once the thing is out and people can go consume this thing. Yeah. Instead of getting caught in this cycle of like, it's going to be perfect. We got to wait till the show and we'll drop it after the show. And after the show, we'll do the merch and after the merch. Yeah. And it's like, nope. <laughs> yeah. No, sorry. No, exactly. And I, Again, I think people just sort of forget why they're doing it. They're doing it because they love music. And I think that if you love yep. music, just just be in a band, do the right things. Don't be stupid with it. Sure, but like, yeah. just just have fun. That's yeah. I, I know I've said it a hundred times that that's the best thing you can do. It honestly. is. Uh, and there's the the sentiment in my head or the classic saying is like, build it and they will come. Yeah. And that's kind of the same thing with the band is like, if you're not having fun being a part of this thing, then no one else is going to have fun consuming exactly. it. Like, whatever that set sale thing was, like people connected to that and enjoyed it. And I think there was music that people enjoyed, but like, it was just an energy. It was just the people that people wanted to be around in a room that people wanted to be in when you guys were on stage. And like, I think that goes so much further than any perfect planning could exactly. ever go. Yeah. We could not have planned anything that we did with that band. Let's just be real here. <laughs> Everything just kind of happened the way it did when it comes to like opening for the right shows and like winning the war tour battle of the band yeah. and recording with that specific person, yeah. like, you know, for like the, the singles and everything. I mean, that did need some planning, but it, you know, a lot of that kind of just sort of, the opportunities here just take it kind of thing and we just we just did yep. so uh one of my last little bullet points here we're at 38 ish minutes and i'm hoping to get in 45 ish uh, okay, i'm hoping to be a little that. little under an hour here sorry to my loyal fans who are so sad about their 15 minutes i'm loyal fan um if you listen to your own episode is that weird i don't know if you're supposed to or not i mean i i used to like i don't know what's proof kosher watch like my content before i yeah. post it and like if i was like streaming i'd go back and like look at my streams just to make sure i didn't say or do anything stupid or whatever yep. so like yeah i i do that i mean it's, it's okay to watch your own Dude, stuff i don't know if i've said it publicly on here i've definitely said it privately a lot uh that i've really enjoyed when i first started this i thought it was gonna be a nightmare to watch myself and edit my voice yeah. and like all these these things and for sure that was true for a little bit it just uh -huh. stunk now I'm at a place where it's like, I don't care. I look like what I look like. Whatever the camera sees is yeah. what everyone else around me sees every day. I was at Stop and Shop today. And like, <laughs> whatever they saw is the same or equal. You know, yeah. the camera doesn't matter. It's the same as uh -huh. everyone. So there's been a freedom in that. And then a freedom of like, I'm watching myself chat and I get a sense of like, oh, I should have been more patient there. Mm -hmm. I should have been more thoughtful there. I should have interjected yeah. here. What if I had asked that question? And it's a really interesting opportunity to like review film of myself and my sports brain of like, yeah, normally we have all these interactions and we walk away from them. And in our head, we have this thing of like, oh, fuck, was I mean? <laughs> you know, or like all these dumb things. Yeah. It's like, no, uh -huh. you weren't. You were normal. Everything was great. You were just, you're just in your head. Yeah. And now I've got this really valuable thing of like going back and being like, oh, I did good there. Uh, that wasn't great. I wish I could do that. Yeah. And it's been kind of a fun, a fun growing process of like, oh yeah, this isn't, isn't as scary as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. No, I think that you definitely need to rewatch your own content. Yeah. I mean, whether, no matter what it is, um, that's how you learn what works, what doesn't. Yeah. Like if you keep making the same mistake, like, or, you know, you, you could fix it. I mean, I think it's, it's very valuable to do that. So I, I do it all the time. Um, I wanted to touch on like worst show. So something that stands out as like the craziest. Uh, I was going through my memory bank of, I think a lot of my memory bank stands out as good stuff. A lot of, I feel like I've been uh -huh. a lot more good stuff than I have as terrible. Uh, there's definitely a couple afternoons that I look back at of like, oh, that was atrocious. The one that stands out the most, um, just to give you a second to think here. <laughs> so I see yeah, like it no, sparks up there. It, because I actually do know the worst show. We oh, ever you got played. okay. Yeah, I me. know it immediately. Um, <laughs> okay. it, it, we made it was but that thing like I sort of go back to where we're like we made the best out of a worst situation. But sure. the worst show is the show that didn't happen. So the show that didn't happen was when we were on tour, and I think we were in 
I forgot what the venue was. I think it was in Massachusetts somewhere. But it was when we were on tour, you know, that whole tour, I have my thoughts on it. But we, we met a lot of great people, like very good longtime friends. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just a fun experience. A lot of the shows were really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that show in Massachusetts, um, I forgot what the specifics were. But all I know is the show got canceled and they didn't tell us. And we showed up, you know, none of us slept the night before because we didn't want to pay for a hotel. We just slept in the van. Like everybody showed up and there was nobody there. And like we like had to, I think, um, the tour manager like had to call like the venue like what's going on and then like they got workers to come over they opened the doors they're like yeah no one's coming man like we, we told them we were closed today kind of thing we're like what the fuck are you serious like we're here we're ready we got our stuff like what are we supposed to do and i remember like you know the way we t- the way we made the best out of that situation was we all just got bombed we just played to each other we were moshing like going absolutely nuts like because the band the tour was huge we had i think it was like six bands yeah. it, everyone was just chilling and having fun but yeah i guess that's that might be the worst just because we were like it just didn't happen so like funny. it was so I've ridiculous it was yeah. so ridiculous how does it even like Happen? How does the venue cancel a show and not tell the people? I, you know, if, if it makes show. you feel any better and gives you some clarity, I don't think the venue's even open anymore. <laughs> that adds up. So that yeah, tracks for that, sure. that was crazy. But um, any other That's bad? Funny. I mean, I don't think I've ever really played like a bad show. I mean, when people say like nobody's there, I, I don't think that really makes it a bad show. Yeah. You know, um, I have way more fun memories than I do bad mm-hmm. ones, even with smaller crowds or just no one there at all. But I think yeah. that's the first thing that comes to mind where it just was like, I'm like, dude, there literally wasn't anybody there. Usually it's like one or two people or like the sound guy or whatever. But like, dude, nobody was at that. Nobody yep. was there. They just opened the door, like do whatever. But we're going to come back at this time and lock it up. And we're like, oh, shit, that sucks. But OK. And we just had fun with it. Damn, dude. Uh, <laughs> just uh, I feel bad asking people to share their bad stories without yep. involving my two cents in. So my version of the words shoot. Uh, and I have to be a little careful here because I've someone paid me to come be a part of this thing. Um, but it was it was a couple of years in the past. Uh, and I had a long drive out to the shoot. Uh, it was like supposed to be like five hour drive. I hit traffic. Oh, it's like six, seven hours. And I pull up there. And I realize it's just me. Normally I have like, at this point in my life, normally I have like someone else with me to help carry you or like yeah. just be helpful in that sense. This wasn't that. This was just me, just me going. So I go, this four hour drive becomes like, or five, whatever hour drive becomes like six, seven hour drives. I get there. Turns out that the place we're filming is like a fourth story walk up and like, it's me. So it's me going up all these stairs and like it's city parking. So I had to park like, I don't know, four blocks away. Yeah. So I'm making like 20 trips from car, a couple blocks up the stairs, <laughs> load in, down, out, right? Uh, and so we filmed the video, and the video goes like, fine. But yeah. I, like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's there's more adventures there, but I don't want to divulge that because that's a little <laughs> too specific. Um, but the video happens, it goes fine. Uh, and then I had planned to spend the night there because I was so far away from home. I knew it was going to be a long yeah. day. I was like... I'll just, I'll spend the night there. But all day I've been like getting up weird vibes of like, this doesn't feel like a, a place that I should spend the night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so one of the things was that there was someone who is, <laughs> uh, told me they were in sobriety and I was like, that's great. You know, I'm happy for you. It's awesome. Yeah. It was all, it was all great. Uh, and then as the shoot progressed, they seemed much less sober than they did at the start of the shoot. Ooh. And it was kind of a peculiar thing of like, it wasn't alcohol. It wasn't like any substance that I could like put my finger on. And at some point he like, taps me or whatever and just kind of like casually admits he's like dude i've been into liquid molly and like i was sober for 12 hours and like dude this shit's the best (laughs) (laughs) it was one of those like dude i've never even heard of someone with like (laughs) a vial of molly (laughs) that he's just like dropping it or i don't even know how you were consuming this and so immediately it's like dude i can't like he's not in sobriety like he just what? took 12 hours off this he morning. was just sober he wasn't like he wasn't like a sober person he was just sober in that moment yeah so then i'm like dude i can't <laughs> stay here but it's also like dude i can't go like i'm so far <laughs> so i ended up driving home and it was one of those where i'll like drive an hour stop get a red bull drive an hour stop get a red bull and thank god going home was like four hours yeah but yeah i left there at 1 a.m got home at 5 a.m after leaving my house at like fucking 9 a.m the morning oh, before no, dude. and it was just one of those like fuck in hindsight i should have just like gotten an airbnb but i'm already only getting paid whatever like 500 bucks for the shoot so yeah. 100 bucks is already going to travel another 100 bucks for a hotel or whatever seems insane to like spend half my money on like yeah. not getting my money <laughs> And it, oh god, it's always stuck in my brain. Like every time I make this drive, and there's a couple like exits I pass, and I'm like, yeah. "Fuck! Thank God I don't turn down that exit again." 
Yeah, that that sounds terrible. I, I don't even know what I would do in that situation. <laughs> it was one of the longest days ever. It just like one of those days like fucked up like seven more days afterwards. <laughs> and just like tried to figure out how to be a human again and get back to get back to life. Oh my god. Um but yeah, lots of adventures. Yeah. Lots of adventures. And that's a good solid 45 minutes. I'm happy to happy to make that happen. Yeah. Um cool. Anything else I wanted to touch on? Nah, that feels feels good, man. Cool. Um Episode 33 in the books. Anything we should chat on? Uh, anything people want to plug before we head out of here? Anywhere people should follow you, find you, look for you in the interwebs? I'm going to be completely honest with you. Hell yeah. I'm you not, haven't been doing I, that I'm, this whole time? I'm not using social media. <laughs> I'm sure people are going to see me pop up and Let's be go. like, yep. oh my God, that kid's still alive. Like, I'm like, no, dude, I just don't use social media anymore. Good. Honestly, long story short, it depresses me. Yep. I can't stand people arguing. I can't stand people yelling at each other. Yep. I can't stand people bragging about the good stuff in their life. I care about me and my friends. I don't care about you. You're a stranger. I don't care what you have to say. So I, I'm anti-social media. If you guys already Hell follow yeah. me, you do. Um, <laughs> nice. I, there's, there's nothing really to plug here. <laughs> I'll be completely real with Perfect. you. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I've heard social media described as like a storefront. And it's like if yeah. you're running an Instagram, it's like running a, it's like running a storefront. People can come window yeah. shop. And like that's cool. But like if you're not selling any products, having people come window shop is a crazy thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like that analogy of like, yeah, you're kind of describing of like I have my people in my life. I don't yeah. need this interaction of like we're good. Life's good. <laughs> this yeah. is good. Yeah, and I just see people just getting so like. I mean, I still use social media. Course, like, I yeah. have like I have like my um my content creator stuff mm -hmm. that I use. I post on Instagram every now and then, Snapchat mm -hmm. sometimes, like TikTok. Sure. But like, I don't really like create or use it for personal stuff. I mean, yep. I just I have my other Twitter for like anime and video games, but yep. so that's why it's separate from Take my shit. other one. But yeah, yep. I, I don't know. That's just me though. Perfect. Though. Hell yeah, mission accomplished. Thirty three in the books. Big red button. 